While the Soviet system fed on public lies, privately, individuals were deeply, suicidally ashamed of possible revelation. Post Thatcher Reagan, the Soviet Union nicely eliminated, we are told the polls prove that the American people approve of their President Clinton, accused of lying, as they consider lying to be an acceptable part of the modern American way of life, which was the hidden way in Soviet life. President Clinton went one third. He made pornography respectable, which would be anathema to Swedenborg's very concept of ideal society, based in Swedenborg on monogam monogamous conjugal love. But I wonder even if all that pornography is not a dumbing down of the American people covering up even more horrifying truths. According to a short piece by Trevor Cavano of the Sun newspaper, Clinton's brother Roger, jailed for drug dealing, is quoted on police tapes saying, Bill Clinton had a nose for cocaine like a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> there are tales of cocaine runs to Colombia and money laundering. Some of those who made the claims have been shot dead or disappeared, including eight investigators, nine witnesses, and four Clinton associates. This is the man our own Prime Minister, Tony Blair, loves. What hope then of Tony Blair's anti-drugs policies? Today's New Labour Britain leads statistically the European League of Youth Drug Taking in honour of President Clinton, perhaps. But then, is Mr. Clinton any worse than any of his predecessors who could simply get away with it? President Kennedy, responsible for Marilyn Monroe's death. President Bush, the partner of the notorious Panamanian drug baron, General Noriega. President Johnson, napalming Vietnam, <coughs> etc. God blessed America seems to be cursed with a string of common criminals as presidents. And yet, I felt very sad and sorry when Mr. Clinton was shown on television as a bumbling old man trying to preserve some dignity, whatever of it was left. Swedenborg's concept of love, I'm finishing, it's my last paragraph. <laughs> Swedenborg's concept of love, nurtured within the context of truth speaking and monogamy, seems to me to be the only hope for a holistic future. Love alone, as the very life of God flowing into men and women, is the divine elixir, the superglue that can cement all aspects of the fragmented and alienated modern individual together. The alternative is virtual reality, robotization, and madness. Thank you for listening.
pianists, but note in Europe, especially in his native land. Couldn't hear? I can't hear you. You can't. Anyway, catch me. The Lydia, our singer. I don't think there is any need to say any more. You have the programs, I think. I will start with the Armenian canticle, the fifth century, which is called the Miraculous Birth. That's why I call today the Miraculous Birth, because Swedenberg lived between 1600 and 1700. Where you have Scarlatti, Hengel, Bach, and Mozart. So they are indeed miraculous births. Yes. 
The philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, had his best known expression as once wrote, of which we cannot speak, we must perforce be silent. Um, a rather gnomic sort of thing to say. It's sometimes thought that it meant that he dismissed anything that was metaphysical. I don't think it meant that at all. But I feel like that today in the presence of this wonderful talk, uh, looking, and I've been looking at those staring, lovely green eyes of the, the picture of Emmanuel Sweden throughout the evening. And then this wonderful end with the beautiful singing um, from this wonderful piece of uh, early Armenian music through more familiar 17th, 18th century, but very beautiful music. This society is certainly grounded in the arts because certainly one of its early members and, and presidents indeed was, was a great singer, particularly of hand, he started life as a choir boy in Westminster Abbey. So I, we can think of our own members, perhaps not those that we will remember, but in the early days, this society actually goes back to 1810, not in this building, of course, but in, uh, there were people singing Handel then, and probably Mozart. Um, and then that talk, well, it was certainly not a, it was a very erudite talk. We'd had Plato and Aristotle, Descartes, Swedenborg, of course, even Madame Blavatsky. Um, but not a cold, dry, intellectual talk, one delivered with great force and passion with all these examples very much from our, our world today. So thank you very much for the tremendous effort you put in this afternoon. And thank you, everybody, for the effort, because we started, of course, by feeding the body before we found, fed the mind and the spirit. Um, so thank you to those who organized the tea. Um, and if I can, just at this very late stage, introduce another name, because we're celebrating the, the birth of Swedenborg 311 years ago, uh, yesterday, although, of course, it was the the uh, Julian calendar, not the Gregorian uh, calendar. Um, but on Thursday, it was the 60th anniversary of the death of William Butler Yeats, a poet who was a tremendous reader of Swedenborg, and uh, a friend of Madame Blavatsky, who was mentioned, and, uh, to some extent a follower, um, and in a prophetic poem, in times that were perhaps even more difficult than these, at the end of the First World War, when Europe was in upheaval, Ireland, his own Ireland, was torn apart by Oppression, I'm afraid, by the British and then by civil war. The poem, I'm not going to recite it all, but the second coming, things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dimmed tide is loosed. The ceremony of innocence is drowned. A picture of the sort of world that we have to date, as Polykin was describing, but this prophetic poem goes on to, to think about a a second coming, not a, an event in the future, but, but something that is happening, coming round and round again. And some rough beast is our, come round, slouches its way towards Bethlehem to be born. And I think we had a feeling this, this evening of this second coming. I think we're all inspired by it. I'd like to, to, to read the text of this sometime and end up to share some of these ideas with Professor Polykian. Um, you've given us much to go away and, and ponder. Um, but I go away very upbeat and hopeful. Um, thank you very much for giving us such a wonderful afternoon. Um, you'll give us something to think about, to come back to, to read about, and send us back. I think those of us perhaps have been reading Swedenborg for some years, some here for many, many years more than me, will send us back with renewed interest and enthusiasm. Thank you very much indeed.